series on temptation. Every week of this series, we've practiced saying a little statement that we can use with temptation. First issue. You know, some of you remember this. If you do, you can say it out loud with me. Temptation, you will not steal my future. You will not steal my family. You will not steal my faith. Okay? Because every time you're tempted, not only is your future at stake, not only is your family at stake, but your faith is at stake. And we talked about how you need to say this out loud, even if it's just a whisper. Why out loud? Because when I'm tempted, there's this little voice inside of the goes, Well, Ken, that temptation is just part of you. You can't get over it because it's inside you, it's part of you. And that is a lie. But we've all fallen for it. The truth is, that temptation is not part of me. That's not just the way I am. That's not just the way I've always been. No, the Bible says that Jesus on the cross has set me free from sin and death. And that temptation is not a part of me. It's coming from outside of me. Sometimes it's coming from the devil or his demons. But whether it is or not, when I speak out loud to that temptation, I am recognizing that I have been set free from that. That temptation is not a part of me. It's coming at me from the outside, and I refuse to let it come inside. And when I recognize that out loud, there is something powerful that happens. If you don't believe me, if you think this is silly, I just challenge you to try it and see if it works. Temptation, you will not steal my future, you will not steal my family, you will not steal my faith. You see, that is essentially what Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness, stories that we've been talking about. He said, temptation, you're not going to be my master. I know there's more at stake here than what's on the surface. I know this temptation is not from inside of me. It's from outside. It's from the enemy. And so I am not going to let it destroy God's good plan for my life. Jesus said that, and it shut down the work of the tempter. And you and I can say that, and it will shut down the work of the tempter in our lives and help us to gain power over temptations. Now, today we're going to look at the third temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Today's message is especially applicable to some of you who are really motivated by progress and achievement and success. And you're always thinking about what can you do better to get ahead financially, get ahead on your job, be more successful, respected. Some of you are goal setters, and you tend to be driven. You want to get the most overtime because if you don't get it, somebody else will get it, and then they earn more on you, and you don't want that. Or, or maybe you're ultra competitive, sort of like me, and you hate to lose in sports or in cards or, or really anything. Or maybe some of you mothers are, are like this by your kids. And you're so focused on their performance that maybe you have a hard time just even letting them play and be kids. You know, you're, you're so uh, intent on them being a, a success in school or sports or music or cheerleading. Maybe you have a goal for your marriage. You know, or maybe you even have a goal for your husband. So it's fun to see how those kind of goals work out. <laughs> but whatever the case, we're talking today, especially to those who are you're Christians and you love God, but you also love to achieve things and make progress and do things bigger and better than you did last year and, and be successful. And because of that, it becomes extremely tempting to take shortcuts. Sometimes what we have is something good, something that God put in our heart to do. And we really want to achieve things for God. We feel like he's the one who led us into the career that we have. And we've devoted our lives and our careers to him. Our motivation is good. But because we're so focused on success, it becomes extremely tempting to take shortcuts. It sets us up for the day when you'll see an opportunity to take a giant step forward. But in order to take that giant step forward, you're going to have to compromise on something that you value. An opportunity will come along for you, and it'll seem like a perfect next step, maybe a promotion or a raise or a scholarship or closing the deal, or maybe it's a relationship with God or girl they want. But in order to get to that perfect next step, it'll require you to do something that you're not completely comfortable with morally or ethically. And your conscience bugs you a little bit, and you know that it, you know, it doesn't really feel right to do it that way, it doesn't seem quite right, but then the thought comes to you. I only have to do it this way one time. It's just temporary. I'll just do it this one time, this one step forward, get this one thing I want, and then 
I'll go right back to paying attention to my conscience, my morals and values. And so just this one time, I'll look the other way, uh, this one time I'll ignore my conscience and do the deal or give in to the pressure or shade the truth, take the money or whatever. It's just temporary. I'll just do it once. I'll set aside my conscience just this once. And, and then once I'm on the other side of it, once I've got that thing that I want, then I'll pick my conscience up again. And you know, then I'll renew my convictions and readopt my values and go right on it. Nobody will know the difference. Nobody will be hurt. Nobody will know anything. It'll be good. And besides, I don't see any other way of moving forward. I don't see any other way of accomplishing what I want to accomplish unless I do the wrong thing. You know, because you know, in the world that we live in and the society that, that we work in and the industry I work in, the people that I work around, you know, there's <clears throat> there's no other way to really get that thing that I want and achieve what I want to achieve. You know, I, I got to play by their rules or I'm going to get left behind. So just temporarily, I'm going to compromise. But but then once I get to the other side, you know, then, then you know, I, I'll be a great wisdom. I'll, I'll go back to the, the values I had before. We all face these temptations in life. Some of you have gone through this many times. Some of you can tell stories about what you've been through. Maybe you're in the middle of something like this right now. Now listen, in that moment of temptation, you're going to discover two important things. You're going to discover, first, who you are. And also, whose you are. In that moment of temptation, when you can see so clearly how to get what you want, how to get what you think you really need in life, what you long for, wait for. But in order to do it, you have to sacrifice something you value. In that moment of temptation and decision, you're going to discover who you really are. In other words, what you really value, what's important to you. And you're going to discover whose you really are. If you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 4. This is continuing the story of how Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. In the first couple of weeks of the story, we saw that there are three major categories of temptation, which we can see in the three ways that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. And every temptation you and I face each day falls into one of these three categories, these three root or core temptations that Jesus faced. The first temptation was to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. This is when I have a a genuine need in my life, but instead of trusting God to provide it at the right time, in the right way, I try to give myself in a way that does not honor God. Okay, the second temptation is to try to use God to accomplish my own ends. This is when we're tempted to manipulate God rather than cooperate with God. We talked about that last week. Today we're talking about the third temptation, which is to do the right thing or a, a good thing at the wrong time, in the wrong way. Basically, take a shortcut. It's the temptation to temporarily abandon our morals or values in order to get something or achieve something that I want in life. Matthew 4, starting verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship him. So Satan says, Jesus, you know, uh, if you just sit, submit to my authority just for this one moment, then I will give you more authority. Just worship me for a moment. Just for a moment. Take what you value and, and take what you know is right. So just set it aside just for a moment. And if you get under my authority, then I will give you more authority. Now, why would this even be a temptation for Jesus? Well, it's because this is the very thing for which Jesus came to earth. Let me explain that. When God first created Adam and Eve, he told them, I have put you here to rule the earth. The earth is under your authority. Everything I've created is now under your authority. And, and your first job is to go and name the animals. And I'm thinking that maybe Adam said, well, God, there's way too many animals. I can't name all those. You name them. God says, no, they're under your authority. You have to name them. So Adam saw a little bug flying by and said, okay, I'll call that one a fly. And, and God probably said, you know, Adam, you're going to have to get a little more creative than that, or you're going to run out of names really quick. Now, I, I don't know, I'm just guessing this is maybe power. But the point is, 
that the earth was now under the authority of Adam and Eve. And so when they sinned, when they followed Satan's temptation, what they essentially did is they shifted alliances, allegiances. They basically said, God, we don't trust you anymore, and so we're going in a different direction. And what happened when they did that? Guess what went with them? The authority over this earth went with them and was now under the dominion of Satan. That's why the Bible calls Satan the prince of this world. And so when Satan tells Jesus, hey, I have the authority to, to give you all the kingdoms of the earth and, and all their splendor, Jesus did not respond, no, you don't. No, that's not yours to give. You don't have authority over this world. No, Jesus didn't say that because Satan did have that authority. And when you read the Bible, you discover this thing that one of the reasons Jesus came is to reclaim authority over this world, over this earth, because it had been lost. And so this temptation involves one of the primary reasons that Jesus came. It is his purpose to get that authority back. And in fact, when Jesus gave us the Great Commission, does anybody remember the first phrase of the Great Commission? Anybody remember that? Okay, and some of you don't even know what the Great Commission is. Basically, the Great Commission is uh, Jesus' instructions to his disciples and the church. On, Here, here's what you need to do after I leave and go back to heaven, okay? And he starts off the Great Commission by saying, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Okay, that's how it starts. But it wasn't given voluntarily by Satan. That would have been the easy way, but Jesus did it the hard way. Jesus won that authority back through his death on the cross. And so in the Great Commission, Jesus is saying, okay, now that I've died and I've, I've gone to the cross and then rose again, all that authority on earth that used to belong to the enemy now has been given to me. That's one of the reasons that I came. And so it is no accident that Satan's final and greatest temptation of Jesus is to take him up on the mountain and offer him that authority over all the kingdoms of the earth. And, and Satan knows that's something that Jesus wants as part of his purpose for coming to get that authority back. So Satan shows it to him and he says, you can have it right now, the easy way. You can have it without the cross, without any suffering, without having to die, and without humiliation and pain, without breaking your mother's heart. You can have all, you can skip all that right now, and I'll just give it to you right now. You can have the authority that, that you came to earth to get if you just submit temporarily to, to my authority. I'll give it to you right now. It was a genuine temptation. Because it was God's will and destiny for Jesus to have that authority. It was the reason he came. And, and now he can have it instantly the easy way. Let me tell you, something like that will happen to you. Maybe multiple times in your life. But it will happen if it hasn't already. It will at some point. You're going to be offered or come across an opportunity to get that thing that maybe you feel like is your destiny. You're sure that it's God's will for you. It's what you were designed for. It's a great thing, something you've been working for for a long time, whether it's that perfect relationship or maybe the perfect kids or, or the great job or some achievement or accomplishments, starting something, growing something, something you've been working for a long time, something you really want. And then along the way, there's going to be an opportunity. And you realize that all you have to do is Kind of take your eyes off of what you believe for a moment. Just suspend your values, just temporarily. And you know that if you just compromise and do that, you'll gain the thing that you have wanted for so long. And that little voice in your head is going, yeah, yeah it's, it's just for this one moment, just, just this one time. And it'll be well worth it when you get that thing that you desire. It's just temporary, so go for it. It's like the uh, little story I heard a Sheehan telling. He said, you know, he, he was praying and praying so hard when he was a kid for, for God to give him a new bicycle. And then he started to realize, you know, th this isn't happening very quickly. And, and God doesn't work very fast. And, and so he, he decided, I'm just going to steal a bike and ask God for forgiveness. 
Well, that's kind of the same idea here. Some of you feel like God just doesn't work fast enough. And so I need to make it happen, even if it's not quite the way God would do it. I mean, I've tried, I've been praying, and I've been working, and I've been doing everything I can. It's just not happening. And, you know, because now you're 40 something or 50 something, and you were sure that you'd have this when you were 30 something, and, and you know, maybe other people around you have got it, your friends do, and, and you don't have it, and it's not working for you, and you start thinking, hey, I'm running out of time. I've been praying, and, and God isn't making it happen, and, and you know, and I'm just going to have to do whatever it takes and take the shortcut, or, or it's not going to happen for me. And in that moment, we think that the issue is just temporary. It's just that one deal, it's just that one relationship, or just that money, or, or that raise. We, we think it's just that one thing that we have our hearts and our minds set on, but that is really not the issue. Do you know what the real issue is? It's peace with God. That's the real issue. The issue is being able to go and bed at night and, and look up at that dark ceiling and, and be able to say, God, I trust you and I know that I'm exactly where you want me to be. Even though I don't know how it's going to work out, I'm doing what you want me to do. But the moment you take the shortcut, and the moment you compromise on what's important for what's immediate, the moment you do that, you lose your confidence. Your Heavenly Father. And if you do that, then when you do get that thing that you want, you get the deal, you get the guy or the girl, you get the job or the money or the prestige or the promotion, whatever it is, when you finally have that thing that you want, what you also have is a question in your soul. And you're wondering, is God really still with me? Oh, oh, yeah, I asked for forgiveness, and, and I'm still going to church. I'm still looking good on the outside, but on the inside, I feel a little different. And in fact, the next time the same situation comes around, I'm going to have to do the same thing or operate the same way because now I'm not sure that God can be trusted. This goes back to what we talked about a couple weeks ago. We, we saw that temptation is always a test of your faith not just your self-control. That's why even the little daily temptations can be a big deal, because each time you give in to a temptation, you're essentially saying no to God. And when you're giving in to little daily temptations, you're saying no to God on a daily basis. And every time you say no, God, no, God, no, God, no, God, every time you say no, it gets a little bit easier, and you get a little bit more comfortable with saying no to God until that's just a normal thing for you to say no to God, and your faith goes down and down and down and down. And that's why temptation is always a test of your faith, not just your self-control. So it comes down to the question, if I bypass this opportunity, if I refuse this temptation, if I don't call back, if I refuse to do the deal, if I refuse to compromise, can I trust God to give me the thing that I need. Can I trust God to take me where he wants me to be? Can God be trusted? That's the question. See, the root issue is not the deal, not the money or the relationship. The issue is, can God be trusted? So Jesus stands there on the mountains with all the kingdoms of the world and all the splendor in front of him, and, and, and Satan is offering to him. How does he respond? Well, he responds the same way he responded every time he was tempted. Instead of just outright refusing, he went to Scripture. He goes back to a situation in the Old Testament where the people of Israel were being tempted. They were about to enter the Promised Land, and God knew that once they got into the Promised Land, they're going to be so wrapped up in conquering their enemies and building houses and building cities and, and growing crops and raising armies. They're going to be so intent on achieving all these goals and you know new things, new opportunities. God knew they were going to be tempted to compromise, to reach those goals more quickly, and to achieve those things more quickly. God knew they were going to be tempted to compromise. So before they even started 
Before they went into the promised land, Moses gives them this sermon, which we now call the book of Deuteronomy, to warn them about this. Moses says to them, before you go in and start building all these homes and cities and armies, before God makes you a great nation, before, before you go in, I, I, I want you to remember who got you there. Remember who got you there. Because you will never accomplish the will of God by abandoning the principles of God. You will never obtain the blessing of God by abandoning the values of God. So let's read what Moses said in Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant, then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God and serve him only. Now here's how this relates to you and me. If you're facing a situation, you're tempted to take things into your own hands. And you're thinking, if I don't make it happen, then it's not going to happen. If I don't do something, I might miss this opportunity and, and this might be my only chance. I don't want to blow it. And I don't think God knows how long I've been waiting for this, wanting this, and praying for this. I, I, I don't want to miss out. If that's the way you're thinking, then God would say, wait just a minute. Who gave you whatever success you have? Who gave you your mind? Who gave you your strength? Who gave you your skills and abilities? And who gave you your kids? Who gave you your opportunities and, and your desire to achieve and succeed? Who gave you all that? God says, I gave all that to you. So why would you think that all of a sudden now I won't be there for you if you trust me? If you trusted me this far, why wouldn't you continue to trust me for the rest of your future? You see, we are all tempted at some time in our lives to sacrifice what's important for what's immediate. We're tempted to sacrifice what's important for what's immediate. And the way you respond to that temptation will show you who and whose you are. And so Jesus refers to the story from the Old Testament in Matthew 4.10. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written. And then Jesus quotes what Moses told people. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Do you know what Jesus wanted more than all the kingdoms of the earth? I mean, he did want the kingdoms. That's the more reason he came. But do you know what Jesus wanted more than the kingdoms of this earth? Unbroken fellowship with his father. And do you know what Jesus got in the end? Both. He got the kingdoms and he got unbroken fellowship with his father. But he had to do it the hard way, not the easy way. Do you know what you and I get when we want the kingdoms of this earth and yet we're willing to temporarily sacrifice our fellowship with our heavenly father in order to get those things? We get neither. We don't get the things that we really want, and we don't have a close relationship with God. But in that moment of temptation, we have to deal with that, because that temptation seems like the only way to get what I wanted. And if God does have another way, I sure don't see it. And so in the moment of temptation, I have to decide, do I trust God? Let me ask you, what is it that you want so bad? And the thing you want probably isn't a bad thing, it's, it's not a sin, but what is it that you want so bad that you consider trading what's important to get it? What is it for you? There, there's something for all of us. We want it enough that in order to get there quicker, we've considered sacrificing our values, our morals, principles, bending the rules, because we want it. We're not sure that God is going to give it to us, at least not quickly enough. Let me read you a story. This is from a book by Donald Miller. He writes, 
John and I were sitting in the family room one night watching Sports Center when he asked about my new cell phone. I got it free, I told him. How'd you get it for free? He asked. Well, my other one broke, and so I took it in to see if they'd replace it. They had this new computer system at the Sprint store downtown, and they didn't have their records. They didn't know whether mine was still under warranty. It wasn't. I knew because I had looked at the receipt before I brought it in, and it was more than a year old. The guy asked me about it. I told him I didn't know, but it was right around the year. Just a little white lie, you know. Anyway, the phone was so messed up, they replaced it with a newer model, so I got a free phone. John kept looking at the phone for a minute, then handed it back to me and went into the kitchen to get an apple. Did you ever see that movie, The Family Man, with Nicolas Cage? John asked while taking a bite out of his apple. There's this scene in the movie where Nicolas Cage walks into a convenience store to get a cup of coffee. And Don Cheadle plays the guy working at the counter. Turns out there's this girl in line before Nicolas Cage, and she's buying something for 99 cents. She hands Cheadle a dollar. Cheadle takes nine dollars out of the till and counts it out to the girl, give me your way too much change, right? And the girl doesn't correct him. She sees that he's handing her way too much money, change for a ten, yet she picks it up and puts it in her pocket without saying a word. And as she's walking out the door, Cheadle stops her to give her another chance. He asks her if there's anything else she needs. She shakes her head no and walks out. So Cheeto looks over at Nicholas Cage and he says, did you see that? She was willing to sell her character for $9. $9. After John says this, he looks back at the television. After a little while, I speak up. You think that's what I'm doing? I ask, with phone and all, you think I'm selling my character or something? And to be honest, I said this with a smirk. I do, John said, not being judgmental, just stating a fact. I don't mean to be a holy roller, Don, he continued, but the Bible talks about having a calloused heart. That's when sin, after a period of time, has so deceived us, we no longer care whether our thoughts and actions are right or wrong. And we have to guard against that. Our hearts will go there easily and often over what looks like little things, little white lines. All I'm saying to you as your friend is, watch out for that kind of thing. John went to bed soon after that, and I served the channels and watched an interview with Richard Nixon from back in the day. He looked tired. This was after all the Watergate stuff. He looked tired, but also relatively innocent. I'm not saying he didn't do anything wrong, but by today's standards, he looked innocent. Basically, he cheated to get ahead in politics. That's hardly a crime today. It's almost like people don't even respect a politician who can't get away with distorting the truth. I didn't like that he looked so innocent. And I wondered why he didn't just admit he did something wrong. I went back to the Sprint store the next day. It cost me more than $9, but I got my character back. There's a point he makes in the story. Little things lead to big things. Little things like cheating on a cell phone lead to big things like Richard Nixon's cheating. They both affect your soul. Little shortcuts lead to big shortcuts. And like I said earlier, when you face a temptation like that, a situation like that, where you're tempted to take a shortcut, you'll discover two things, who you are and who you are. And so, I want to say something that might be surprising to you. I actually wish for you, I hope for you, to have a situation like that to face in your life, if you haven't already. A time when you have to abandon something you really want in order to follow God. A time when you realize that even though that, that thing that you want isn't bad, it might be a, a really good thing, but you realize that if you went in that direction, it would take you away from your relationship with God. It would cause you to compromise. It would be a step back in faith. And it's not God's best for you right now. I wish for every one of us a time like that where you have to choose to take a, a real step of faith to follow your Heavenly Father. 
And I pray that when that time comes, that you will have the courage and wisdom and patience to choose your Heavenly Father and relationship with Him. Because when that time comes, then you'll be able to lay back in your bed at night and look up at that dark ceiling and say, I don't know the future. I don't know where God is going to take me. But I know that right now, I'm exactly where he wants me to be. And I'm doing exactly what he wants me to do. And I trust God. We're going to close in just a moment. So I'd like to wish Ben to come up. You know, as I, I think about this, there was a, a time a little over 20 years ago when I had to make a hard choice similar to this. I decided to quit my corporate job with NCR and take a huge pay cut and give up all the, uh, the health benefits and the perks and the retirement plan and become pastor of this church when it was very small. I made a decision to abandon those dreams that I had of corporate success and prosperity and security and trade all that for uncertainty and what looked like poverty at the time. And when I did that, all I could say was, God, I don't know where you're taking me. I just know that right now, I'm doing what you want me to do. I'm where you want me to be. And I trust you for the future. And let me tell you, I have never for a moment regretted that decision. And when you have that kind of opportunity, in that moment, when you choose, you'll discover who you are and whose you are. Bottom line of everything I'm going to say today, don't trade what's important for what's immediate. Because if you do, you'll never discover what God could have done if you simply trusted Him. The standard prayer. Heavenly Father, would you give us the wisdom and the insight to recognize what is really important in life? And then would you give us the courage and the patience never to sacrifice what's important for what's immediate? God, would you help us to trust you, to wait on you to meet our need at the right time, in the right way, in a way that will honor God? Father, every time temptation comes at us today and this week, would you help us to respond in faith? Temptation, you will not steal my future. You will not steal my family. You will not steal my faith. This morning, if you're not sure of your relationship with God, you can be sure to do that by simply making a decision and praying a short prayer with me. Your heart, God, will hear you. Just say something like this. God, right now, I choose you. I give my life to you as much as I know how. Jesus, will you be my Lord and my Savior? Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me so all my sins can be forgiven. So that I can be right with you. I thank you for new life. Now you have my life. In Jesus' name.